Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation on the scientific method, which is going to be one of the core concepts of general biology. So we first start off by looking at two forms of scientific investigations, or categories of research. The first category is termed observational or discovery science, and in this category of research, typically there's no pre-existing knowledge regarding something that's being observed, um, and it's a novel phenomenon. And it's largely going to consist of qualitative data that's collected regarding the subject matter, but it can also be quantitative in nature. And our best example is Charles Darwin's uh, body of research exploring a large amount of the nature found around the world and describing that. The second category of research is termed experimental or hypothesis-driven science. And in this particular category, it's what we think of as the scientific method, where scientists are going to seek explanations for their observations. This is largely going to consist of collecting quantitative information, but there is usually some qualitative information that is collected as well. Now to back up just a second and explore what exactly we mean by those two terms, uh, by the term qualitative, we're meaning descriptive information, or information that cannot be measured. Um, color, height, size, weight, things along those lines. Quantitative, however, is a term that's referring to something that is numerical in nature, and therefore measurable. Now, if we take a look a little bit closer at the scientific method, we find that there's a general process that scientists follow, and we also find that it tends to be quite cyclical in nature. So in looking at the process, we first want to take a look at the steps that are involved within the scientific method and then the difference between a hypothesis and prediction. So as far as the steps go within the scientific method, scientists typically are going to make an observation or they may encounter a problem that they want to look into a little bit further. They're going to form a question that is going to specifically tie in to the research they're conducting. They propose a hypothesis, state a prediction related to that hypothesis. They're then going to experiment and collect data, analyze the results, draw a conclusion, and communicate with their peers and the general outside community or world. Now, it's important to note that there's an a very specific difference between a hypothesis and a prediction. A hypothesis is going to be a possible explanation for a problem that can be tested. So for example, we could say students who attend class do better on exams because they're coming to class to learn the material. Uh, the prediction would be what you expect to see happen if your hypothesis is correct. So if students attend class, then they will receive a high score on their exams. It's important to note the difference between those two. Now I mentioned that the scientific method is cyclical in nature, and it turns out to be quite an iterative process, as opposed to the linear process we just took a look at. So obviously we're going to start by making observations and forming questions regarding a certain topic. Um, from there, the hypothesis or predictions initially will be formed. Scientists will conduct experiments and analyze results. But more often than not, what will happen is that the outcome of those experiments and results is going to require that the scientists go back and refine, change, or rework their hypothesis. They may actually go back and even change their question again. So there's a lot of a lot happening within this part of the cycle before they move on to the next steps. Eventually, they're going to come to some conclusion with the new observations. And um, it, typically, there's going to be new observations at the, at the uh, conclusion of the experiment. And that kind of drives further experimentation regarding the topic. So it is very rare that you will have an experiment that kind of addresses all questions. Usually you have to go back and rework things or explore more of the topic a little bit more in depth. So if a hypothesis is always correct, eventually it's going to become a theory. 
but obviously with all of this reworking and changing that's very difficult to achieve so there are very few theories out there now an important component or aspect to the scientific experiment is something called variables and a variable is going to be a factor or a trait or a condition that it exists in different amounts or types so we have certain forms or types of variables that are that are kind of categorized within the scientific experiment experimentation and we also have different groups that are formed in the scientific method so if we take a look at the types of variables we tend to find in an ex in a scientific experiment first up is our independent variable or our test variable this is going to be the variable that you apply or change in your experiment and typically speaking, we expect that it will cause an effect on the dependent variable. Now in looking at the dependent variable or response variable, this is gonna be the, the variable that changes when the independent variable is applied. It's gonna be the thing that you measure or observe. So if you're not quite sure what your dependent variable is, it's good to think about what it is you expect to observe or measure. Finally, we have something called controlled variables. And there are going to be many of these. And we try and control as many external variables or unimportant variables to our experiment as possible. Essentially, these are gonna be conditions that are kept the same for all groups. And a scientist or a group of scientists have to think quite hard about this ahead of time so they don't um, accidentally include factors or variables that are influencing the results or try to minimize that as much as possible. Uh, within an experiment there are two groups oftentimes. There's an experimental group which is going to be the group of, uh, of um, uh, either patients or, or, or subjects that are subjected to the independent test variable and this is essentially where we are going to measure a response the experimental group. We are also going to have something called a control group, which is going to be the group that's treated identical to the experimental group, with the exception, and a big exception, that the independent variable is not going to be applied. Uh, so really this serves as a standard for comparison um, of the results that we obtain from uh, both groups. Now finally, we have a couple different examples we can take a look at, and uh, I'll give you an opportunity to try these out yourself a bit. So in these two examples or scenarios, I ask what are the independent, dependent, and control variables for each example, and what does a control group look like? So in our first example, example number one, we have a scenario where a researcher is interested in the effect that the amount of fertilizer applied to a fruit tree has on the amount of fruit produced. So I'm gonna pause right here. If you need to pause a little bit longer in order to respond, go ahead and do that. All right, so let's take a look at our results here. So an independent variable in this scenario is going to be the amount of fertilizer that was applied to the plants dependent variables are going to be the amount of fruit produced. That's what we measure, what we observe. And then the control, several control variables, although there can be many, are things like the amount of light they're exposed to, all the plants are exposed to, the amount of water, and the type of fruit plant that we're measuring. A control group would be a group of trees with no fertilizer applied. In this next example that we have, example two, in this scenario, a researcher is interested in finding out if the daily dosage of aspirin will affect the heart attack rate in men. So remember, you're taking a look and thinking about the independent variable, dependent variable, controlled variables, and a control group. So I'll give you a few seconds. All right, so in looking at our response here, an independent variable would be the dosage or the amount of daily asp aspirin. A dependent variable would be the number of heart attacks of men annually, because that's the thing you're measuring. 
the controlled variables, a couple of them might be the age of the men, their occupation, their level of exercise. And finally, a control group is going to consist of men that are given a placebo or no drug, or a group of men that are given nothing at all. The reason why we have placebos in medical experimentation is because of the fact that uh, oftentimes there's a psychological component to these medical case studies, as nobody wants to get a heart attack. So that hopefully gives you a little bit of background about the scientific method, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation.